been the source for many scientists, journalists, historians, policymakers, and other investigators to clearly demonstrate how industry has actively undermined science and public health. I've been pleased over the last two years to work with Tracy on the Rapid Response Network, a nationwide collaborative of scientists who work to support environmental health science in the current period, including gathering large numbers of people to provide public comments aimed at preserving the historical legacy of EPA and other environmental policy and regulation. So with all of that, we're very fortunate today to have Dr. Tracy Woodruff speak on, without consent, chemical exposure in our health. Hi, Phil, this is Tracy. Hello, everyone on the phone. And thank you for reminding me I um, have, I did have that uh, title for my talk. I'm also going to talk about uh, mass spectrometry data um, to understand chemical exposures during pregnancy. So um, you can tell that I'm continually borrowing and recycling some of my slides in the interest of uh, helping preserve the environment. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you so much for the introduction and for um, uh, inviting me to speak on this call. I am going to talk about some work that we're doing on understanding chemical exposures during pregnancy, particularly because I'm sure everyone on this call is very familiar with the scientific evidence, but that um, exposures during pregnancy are particularly, can be particularly impactful because of this very unique and important developmental period. And one of the challenges that we have is that we have not really all, we don't have all the information we need to truly understand both exposures and what those exposures mean for the prenatal period and the implications for future child and adult health. So uh, one of the um, exciting parts about doing this research is that there's been a lot of technological advancement in understanding both our genomic um, and exposomic um, exposures that occur and how those can influence health. So people I'm sure are familiar with the genome and there has been some work that has been going on to complement that with the exposome, which has uh, been characterized by Christopher Wild and later by Martin Smith and Steve Rappaport in articles talking about the totality of human environmental exposures from conception onwards. Uh, one of the other um, uh, areas that has been very exciting in terms of under looking at health uh, populations is this the explosion in the types of data that we have available to understand the trajectory of disease and the etiology of disease. So I know that many of your universities and our own university at UCSF, there's been a very high investment in understanding some of the biological factors that contribute to disease etiology, including genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and now people are very expanding the area of metabolomics, et cetera. But one of the areas that we still is under probably underappreciated is what's the contribution of the exposome or the totality of our exposures to health. And we have been focusing on the exposome can, can comprise many different aspects, including chemical exposures, your physical environment, your social environment, um, your, the types of food you eat. Uh, but we're very interested in the chemical exposure contribution to the exposome and to health outcomes because and we, what we know already about certain types of exposures and how they contribute to health is that they can be very important and influential in child health and adult outcomes. But we actually have very um, limited information about the totality of exposures that the public may be experiencing. So this uh, slide illustrates uh, what we know about chemical exposures um, in, among the population. So we know that there's a no, many different chemicals that are manufactured and used in the United States. Um, this uh, fact that we ha I have on the slide talks about the number of high-use chemicals. So high-use chemicals are chemicals that are used or imported in greater than 25,000 pounds. And so there's about 8,000 high-use chemicals that um, are used in, or imported in the United States. But we really only have um, substantial biomonitoring, which I mean widespread like through NHANES or through other types of academic institutions for about less than 3% of these chemicals, so about 300 chemicals, about 350 chemicals. Um, so there's a large proportion of chemicals that we don't have very good information about the extent to which way we may be exposed to these chemicals. 
and we have um, a high probability that there may be some exposures because we know they're being used or imported in great amounts in the population in the in uh, in the United States. Okay, why it's not going? Uh oh, just a minute. My slide seems to have froze. There we go. So we do have data that we have produced and other people have shown that we know that there are many different ways that you can be exposed to industrial chemicals, um, whether it's from air pollution, products in your home, drinking water, personal care products, or other types of products that you're using daily, um, uh, contaminants in food. Um, or for very importantly for certain populations who um, may have occupational exposures at work. Um, and this is, uh, just if people are familiar with the work that we did characterizing chemical exposures among pregnant women using the NHANES data. And what we found from the data from NHANES is that there are at least 43 different chemicals that are measured in 99 to 100% of women, pregnant women across the United States. So we, um, now have good information showing that we know already that there are dozens of chemicals to which pregnant women are exposed. And from this, we are, we hypothesize that there are likely more uh, chemicals than um, we are currently measured because currently our technology is not capturing possibly more of these exposures. So I'm going to talk about the chemosome, which we've character, which we have uh, defined as the chemical component of the human exposome, um, which was defined by Christopher Wilde in 2005. Oh. Mm. Tracy, perhaps, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think there's a, like a delay between when I hit the button and when it goes, so I'll just keep talking. I want to give a, a little more context about the extent of chemical exposures. So many people are familiar with the number that are registered for use in the United States. So I talked about the 8,000 that are high use, uh, and many people talk about the 80,000 chemicals that are registered under um, EPA's uh, Toxic Substance Control Act. But uh, we talk less, less about the extent of how much is produced or used in the United States. And EPA also records the volume of chemicals that are produced or imported in the United States. And um, in 2016, the amount was 9.5 trillion pounds. So that's about 30,000 pounds of industrial chemicals that are produced for each person in the U.S. And so this, this says 2012, but it's similar for the data in, um, which has been up, was updated in 2016. And the challenge that we have is, is that most of these chemicals, similar to not understanding the full extent of what exposures may be, we also don't have um, we have very little information about the extent to which they may be uh, impacting health among the population. So I'm going to talk about human exposures and some work that we're doing to characterize the, the chemosome here at UCSF, and then touch on um, understanding how that may be linked to health effects and how do we also translate or interpret this information for use in um, decision-making context, particularly when it comes to uh, informing policy decisions that are based on this type of scientific information. So the goal is to um, talk about the pregnancy chemosome and some ways that which we can use this technology that we've been developing or others are working on um, to prioritize chemicals of interest for further investigation. So we have been advancing a methodology um, called uh, suspect screening. And I'm going to walk through this paper that we recently published on the method to characterize multiple chemical exposures among a demographically diverse population of pregnant women that we recruit here at UCSF in our clinics. And the study um, we have, sorry, there we go. So we're using a um, high resolution mass spectrometry platform to um, basically do a chemical scan of biological samples that we collect from pregnant women. Um, this is some details about the platform, which is a QTOP LCMSMS. Um, it allows a sub two uh, parts per million mass accuracy. 
and we can assign chemical formulas based on, um, okay. So we um, have different types of analyses that we currently can do for biomonitoring. So this is an example of um, the different options that are available. So down on the bottom, if you have a biological sample or along the top, most people who are doing biomonitoring studies do targeted analysis. So they identify a priori what chemical that they're going to measure in the biological sample. And then they, the method is developed to measure that chemical, and then you get what is called a targeted analysis, which produces the, um, the amount detected and the level of that chemical that's in the biological sample. What we've been seeing is an increasing use of this non-targeted method, which basically produces a, a scan of uh, features that are in a, present in a biological sample. Um, we uh, do that by uh, processing the sample and ionizing the uh, chemicals that may be in the sample and then measuring the mass of the different uh, compounds that are in that sample. And there's two different ways that you can do that. You could have a non-targeted where it's agnostic and you have many features that you could be evaluating for presence of different types of chemicals, which can range from industrial chemicals to endogenous chemicals that are present already in the body. But we're um, actually interested in understanding which of those features may be uh, industrial chemicals to which people are exposed. So we are looking at a suspect screening. So we're basically taking the chromatogram and comparing it to a database that we already have of industrial chemicals we suspect may be present in that biological sample. And I am going to continue, ah, here we go. So the targeted analysis I already described, which um, uses reference standards and you know a priori what you're going to be analyzing in that sample. The suspect screening, we have a list of chemicals against which we are going to be screening for, but we don't necessarily have um, a know that we're going to be looking for those chemicals. We don't have a reference standard. So the key difference between this is that we'll get information from this um, from this method that will give us the likelihood that there may be something present in the sample that matches that particular chemical that we're uh, looking for, but we have to develop a targeted method to confirm its presence and level. And then the non-targeted analysis is we aren't going to really scan it against any prior information. So we're focusing on this. Um, we're not going in this completely blind. We're actually going in with a group of uh, chemicals against which we think may be present in the biological sample. So this gives um, an overview of the process. We have human serum samples. We process it through our, um, our QTOP LCM SMS. We get uh, mass peaks based on their retention times or based, loosely based on the mass of the different um, items that are present in that biological sample. And then we compare it against a suspect chemical database or roadmap. So um, those chemicals that we get come from these different sources, including the EPA's chemistry uh, dashboard, which I highly recommend is an excellent source of information about um, industrial chemicals that are uh, used or potentially present um, in the, uh, in various, from various literature sources, PubChem. And then we look, we compare the suspect chemical uh, database to the mass spectrometry and pick out detected suspect features. So those are masses that are matched to our candidate chemicals in our database. And then for select few, we actually uh, purchase reference standards and run it against the, uh, against the chromatogram to uh, do confirmation of those uh, potential suspects that are present in the sample. Um, this is some more details about some of the uh, ways that we, uh, the method that we're using to identify the formula matching. I want to just point out that we, uh, the way you can run this QTOF machine is there's two different modes, a negative mode and a positive mode. The negative, it basically talks, that's in reference to the ionization of the, of the sample. And what uh, you come, depending on the mode you're running, you are more or less likely to detect certain types of chemicals depending on where they're more uh, acidic or less acidic, essentially their charge carriers. So for this 
methods development, we are running the um, but we're running the process through the negative mode. So we're really going to look for a subset of chemicals that are uh, basically more acidic or more potential to be uh, eluded in this mode. And this is important because we're we did this originally to develop the methodology. So um, once we have developed this methodology, we're actually going on to expand the ways that we're doing this um, this analysis by expanding our potential for uh, different chemicals we can detect. So the find by formula works on looking at accurate mass isotope patterns, the peak shape, which was in that chromatogram, the, essentially what the peak looks like, and then the retention time, which is a measure of the uh, mass. So you can see this again as those items are used to evaluate this mass spectrometry out, output that comes from the high resolution mass spectrometer. So in our study, we, as I mentioned, we were recruiting pregnant patients who attend clinics here at UCSF. They, um, we have uh, in this sample 75 women who come from two different clinics at UCSF, um, one here at Mission Bay and the other one at uh, San Francisco General Hospital. These are clinics, one of the other aspects of this study is we're very interested in how chemical exposures may differ by different um, demographic characteristics. So we're looking at both differences in income as well as um, maternal race, because we hypothesize that exposures are going to be different and, and higher in those who are uh, women who are more either lower SES or um, non-white populations. We are comparing it to a in-house database that we developed, which actually is available on the EPA website, um, the chemical dashboard. It's got 500 and unique formulas, about 700 different chemicals that, as I mentioned, are environmental organic acids, so they're slightly acidic, and these are the chemicals that I think are more likely to be detected when we run the high-resolution mass spectrometer in the negative mode. So the database consists of chemicals that um, both have this type of feature in terms of being slightly acidic, and then our uh, industrial chemicals that are used, e either registered for use, such as environmental phenols like bisphenols, parabens, et cetera, uh, perfluorinated chemicals, a few flame retardants, not that many, and phthalate metabolites. And also, we happen to have, because of the structure of the database, uh, available pesticides and pesticide metabolites available. So this is an overview of the method that we used. Um, as I mentioned, we have an LCQTOF MS, which puts out the mass chromatogram. We um, do the database matching to identify the chemicals which may be uh, uh, present in the sample using a, the suspect database of about 700 environmental organic acids and this find by formula, which is a, as a pro program that's uh, comes with the machine. Um, we get these suspects peaks, we review them, um, we identify uh, uh, isomers, different isomers and by retention time. Then we go through and prioritize these chemicals so um, to identify, because one of the things that we're also doing in this study is identifying the potential scan, the scan of potential uh, features or candidate chemicals in these biological samples and then we want to prioritize them because we're going to be developing down the road a targeted method for those chemicals which are of interest, which I'll talk about how we decide that, and then we confirm them. So here's the overview again of the method. I want to also add that we do administer a questionnaire during the second trimester. So these, these blood samples, we're doing this in blood, they're collected during the second trimester of pregnancy we administer a questionnaire to um, collect information about demographics, and we're also interested in potential sources of some of the chemicals we may be identifying um, in the biological sample. So our questionnaire covers uh, different aspects of consumer product use. And um, then we also have uh, tie these, the, each of these women to their medical records because we can then look at birth, rec birth outcomes. So another feature of this 
research is while we are conducting the study to understand better what chemical exposures are, or what chemicals are present in pregnant women, we have two different other areas that we want to expand this into. One is just because we know the chemical is present in a biological sample, that doesn't necessarily give us information about where those chemicals came from. So we want to begin to understand the sources of exposure because that is the next step in uh, identifying interventions for those chemicals that are uh, potential health risk. And the other end is we want to be able to understand um, what these exposures may mean for health risk. So we link it on the other side to looking at these types of health outcomes with these birth records. And so here we're focusing on um, gestational age and birth weight. And you can see that um, just that just to reiterate what I just said, we get these essentially we're looking for these uh, one of these these 700 approximately 700 chemical signatures. We get the mass and then we can confirm it and look at the relationship to both sources of exposure as well as health outcomes. So here is what we found from their scan, which is here are the participants here on the left. So we have 75 participants. We measure, um, the output is the number of suspect EOAs. So the total can be as I said, up to um, around 700. You can see that all these women have some level or some number of potential chemical hits in, present in their blood starting with a mean minimum of 36 up to a maximum of 82 and a mean of 63. The different colors represent the different chemical classes <clears throat> which are compose our database of about 700 environmental organic acids. So we have groups of pesticides which are in here, um, phenols which are in this middle, a few perfluoroalkyl substances which um, are in here, and then phthalate, phthalate metabolites, and then ones that weren't, couldn't be characterized within those classes. I just want to note that I don't actually have these in the slides, but the majority of the chemical classes in our database are pesticides and phenols, so it makes some sense that those are most of what we're seeing present in the sample. So, as I mentioned, one of the things that we want to do in this study is look for, um, to use this to help us prioritize where to develop new targeted methods for confirmation um, of and levels of uh, chemicals at which are novel in terms of measuring in, in pregnant women. So as part of that, we looked at these environmental organic acids that were detected in greater than 80% of our sample, so it's about more than 60 women. We rank them by detection frequency, so that's this DF right here. So you can see starting at the top that PFOS was measured in all of the women, was identified, not measured, sorry, was identified in all the women in our sample down to about 61 down here, which the cutoff was 60, which is a phthalate. Um, this corresponded to 15 suspect EOAs formulas matched to 27 compounds. So one of the other features of this analysis is that some of these chemicals are isomers of each other, so they have the same chemical formula but different structure. Here's a good example right here. Here's a, a phenol. Um, they all have the same chemical formula um, and they have four isomers. So it could be these. this chemical formula could match to four different um, chemical, individual, individual chemicals. But right now we are just detecting this, so we do have different retention times which we can kind of suss out whether, which ones these might be. So the other thing we're interested in, I just want to go back and say another thing about this. So um, one, it, um, so one of the advantages of this platform is that we can scan for many different types of chemicals to give us information about what might be present in a biological sample, but I didn't mention this in the methods, but the, um, the sensitivity is not going to be as good as if you do a method, develop a method and do a targeted analysis. 
Um, so I just want to point that out as one of the challenges. But what's interesting is, and because because we had never done this before, so uh, one of the things we're trying to suss out is how accurate is this in terms of identifying things we know actually should be present in these samples. And you can see right here is that the, this PFOS, which we know um, from previous targeted analysis studies are found in 100% of pregnant women are also showing up in our suspect screen. So that gives us some uh, more confidence that this is um, identifying chemicals we know to be present. Now some of the other ones that um, we know should be present are not coming up as much. I think one that you might think of right now is like uh, BPA. So that didn't make our top tier because it wasn't found in greater than 80%. So some of the ones that we also know should be in pre widely present are not necessarily showing up in very high amounts, but might be showing up in lower amounts. So the other thing we're interested in is which ones of these do we have some type of information on because, again, we want to identify opportunities for um, new biomonitoring or new studies on chemicals that may be an important health risk factor. So here we have which of these chemicals are currently biomonitored by NHANES, so a few of them, but not all of them, or by the uh, California Health Biomonitoring Program. Here's another one we're also interested in, which is which of these chemicals are high production volume, which um, this, I think we define in greater, there's different ways to define high production volume, but I think this one is greater than a million pounds. So this is interesting because there's not necessarily a complete match between chemicals that are high production volume chemicals and chemicals for which we have targeted biomonitoring. So what we're interested in knowing is, are there chemicals which have a lot high production volume in the United States but um, we haven't biomonitored them before and might represent opportunities for exposures. So we have a few here. I, I just want to say that data actually is not completely complete from EPA because some, um, some chemicals, there's no information on their production volumes. So, uh, so about half of the match chemicals, about half of the, about half the chemicals that we identified in the top 80% have not been biomonitored. So here's a summary of, so then we did, as I said, we did a confirmation where we bought the reference standard for some of these chemicals, ran it through the machine to confirm whether that compound was present. So here um, are some of the compounds that we um, identified that have not been previously biomonitored but present in the sample of the uh, 75 pregnant women. And you can see that, um, they're not, well, they're not super familiar to me. What well, pyrocatechol I've heard of for, but there's a number of different uh, chemicals here, and two of them are used in 10 to 50 million pounds per year. So this was interesting that two of these chemicals are actually high volume chemicals, which had not been previously biomonitored uh, before. And here is data that comes from EPA CPCAT database. Again, I highly recommend this resource from EPA because you can go in and see what type of chemicals, what, where there's information on where different chemicals are used in commerce. Again, there's a lot of uncertainties in this data because um, manufacturers are not required to report where they're using things, so it comes from kind of a variety of sources, some of them from purchased from um, uh, retailers like Walmart, but so, but what we have is that you can see that some of them are used in, uh, um, so for example, this one right here, 235-dietrotylbutylsilic acid, there's no information available about that. That doesn't mean that it's not being used or there's health hazard, not health hazard information, but that companies may request it not to have it, um, not to have any information available because of what they claim is confidential business information. So, some of these are used in, as you can see, a lot of cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, personal care products. It's very common among the uses of these chemicals. So one of the ways that we're expanding is this, is we're expanding the number of women we're measuring, and then this is an example of what we've done to increase the uh, sample size for the number of participants we have in the study. I've mentioned we're also going to be expanding the range of chemicals that we can a screen for in this analysis. So this is the results from expanding from 75 to 200 serum samples. And we're seeing a very 
similar profile across all 200. We find about 1,000 suspect features, which is similar to before. Um, and the median is about, of um, chemical hits is about 48, with a max of 200. So as we might anticipate, the mean is 57. The mean and the median are relatively stable, but the variability is goes up as we add more people into our population. And this on here is the mass and then the retention time, which gives information about essentially the schematic that shows where the different hits are occurring and the size of the bubble is how often it's been detected. So you can see there's some people who have quite a number of hits, but there's a lot of different chemicals which are um, lightly detected. So I talk about, um, now that we have a lot of information about these different potential chemical exposures, how, what are some ways that we can think about looking at the health effects or sources of exposure? So one of the things I mentioned that we're doing is a value, we can now take these number of suspects and begin some, these are kind of prioritizing, say they're not final, but helping us understand um, what might be the relationship between chemicals we are measuring, uh, screening for in blood and their relationship to either chemical exposures or, or birth, out, birth outcomes. So a larger goal of this work is to help us understand um, if, we're, if the chemical load that we're seeing during pregnancy, um, how that might relate to uh, either one of the exposure sources and or outcomes. So I just say these are very preliminary. They were presented at um, International Society of, of Environmental Epidemiology recently. But you can see in this graph here, so we have the exposure sources up here, personal care products used daily, a number of household cleaning products used daily. So women are asked how many household products they use daily or how many personal care products do they use daily. And it's, um, it, we see that as the number of products used daily, uh, there's an increase with the number of um, basically uh, chemical hits in the sample that goes up, which we would anticipate. But interestingly, we see the opposite with the household cleaning product use. So already we have, it helps us develop uh, hypotheses that we can go and test to evaluate the accuracy or the, what, what we're seeing in this information. Similarly, um, you can see that the, um, we see the, again, the gestational age here and birth weight is kind of an opposite. But as gestational age goes down, we see maybe some increase in the number of chemical hits, but it's not really a, um, overwhelming. And similarly, we aren't really seeing a lot with birth weight. So it could be that, you know, it's not a very sensitive marker, but um, there may be more to learn when we look at um, at individual exposures or expand the number of chemicals we're evaluating. So I want to go back to, so that's one way we can look at the relationship between these health effects is do we see any relationship to these uh, birth outcomes that we can collect off of the medical records? But another way to look at this is, um, is there other ways to evaluate other types of health effects that may be associated with these industrial chemicals. Birth outcomes are both a little bit of a crude measure in a lot of ways because they aggregate things that have uh, birth weight or gestational age, really a marker of things that have occurred um, to affect the pregnancy the development during, of the fetus during pregnancy. And maybe there might be other types of either more um, targeted health effects or uh, subtle health effects that might be better measured to evaluate against these chemicals. So just to reiterate that here is that we also, when we looked at these, these are the chemicals that we confirmed um, in our suspect screening. You can see we also have information on their health hazard, which in many cases is not that much, or is um, in some of these cases, which doesn't say the date of this, but this one here, like 2,4-dinitrophenol, is actually quite old. Um, but there's 
also a lot that we don't know about the health effects of these chemicals, which we had already hypothesized to be true because there's, this is not required to know the health effects of chemicals before you put things on the marketplace. So health hazard has some information, we have some information that these two might have estrogenic effects or one of them has been uh, identified as a possible human carcinogen. So one of the things that we've initiated here at UCSF through an augmented uh, Victor grant, which is a virtual consortium grant that NIHS um, puts out to encourage uh, multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary collaborations, is to take these chemicals that were screening in uh, via our suspect screening and a look in different assays, either medium throughput or high throughput assays to understand the potential for these chemicals to result in developmental health risks. So this is some work being done with Dr. Jennifer Fung, who's here at UCSF, and Dr. Patrick Allard, who's at UCLA, to screen um, these chemicals that we detect or we identify potential chemicals we identify in this, via the suspect screening in a yeast screening assay that screens for meiosis, which is a reproductive health effect, and a C. elegans assay, which is essentially a worm, which also can screen for reproductive developmental effects. So we have the ability to take this information we're generating from our suspect screening to help us identify um, whether these chemicals have potential for health risk, independent of whether we've already identified them in a um, human study. So when we're doing these screening, though, I want to talk a lot broader about identifying chemical priorities. So as I mentioned, uh, we are screening for about 700 chemicals in the suspect screening that we're doing now. We're actually going to be expanding that database to about 3,000 chemicals because we're going to be screening in both the positive and negative mode in the, um, uh, in the QTOF. But that still is, doesn't, um, if you remember from the beginning of the talk, I said that there's about 8,000 that are used or imported in greater than 25,000 pounds. So we still have choices that we have to make um, in terms of what we're going to look for in terms of chemical exposures. So we have some information from the suspect screening, and then we have other information from other types of sources like uh, EPA's uh, chemical dashboard that can help us sort through ways to identify chemicals that are we should be prioritizing for evaluating in not only these biomonitoring studies but other types of health studies. So in terms of the heart study that we're doing, we have been um, going through a process because as I mentioned, we're doing this, this study where we're collaborating to uh, look at these chemical exposures in these medium throughput models to identify their potential for reproductive and developmental health effects. And we can look at the chemicals that come up from the suspect screen, but we also have an opportunity to test for other chemicals that might be of high interest. So I want to talk about how we're prioritizing these chemicals. This is also relevant for how many other groups are trying to prioritize chemicals to identify, because you have a very big universe of chemicals. How do you decide where to start? So the way that we're thinking about this is to look at things that are actively being evaluated in the regulatory process right now. So we're looking at the Toxic Substances Control Act, which um, was an amended version was passed in 2016. And we're seeing implementation occurring right now. So it's been two years. And there's 10 chemicals that are actively going through risk evaluation right now. So we can actually include those both in our screening process and our um, our, our testing method process to evaluate their potential to be either present in human samples and or um, whether they can have reproductive developmental effects. We also are interested in organophosphate flame retardants, so newer flame retardants, the chemicals that we're identifying through our suspect screening, as well as I want to say that we also can add in now that we have this opportunity to look at chemical exposures through the ECHO program, which is the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes. So I'm going to just take a brief detour to talk about the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes, ECHO, as another important opportunity for us to be able to understand more broadly chemical exposures and their health implications um, in the population. So ECHO, I think most people 
are uh, familiar with this on the call, is a link longitudinal child cohorts of about 50,000 cohorts across the country. The cohorts are located in the areas that are marked by green dots. And the goal is to understand risk factors and interventions focused on primarily four outcomes. Pregnancy outcomes, obesity, neurodevelopment, and respiratory. And within ECHO, what's really great is that we have, because they're collecting biological samples from the different life stages, we have an opportunity to also go through a process to identify op um, opportunities for biomonitoring and understanding chemical exposures and health effects that complement the other work that, I, that we're doing at UCSF and that other people may be doing to understand exposures and health effects. So this is from some work that, oh, yes, that is being led by Ido Pelizari and Debbie Bennett at UC Davis to um, use available data. And again, using that data that's being collected right here is the data that's being collected by EPA uh, through their chemical dashboard, but also data from USDA, FDA, and EPA to um, understand this is to look at sources of exposures from drinking water, air, house dust, house dust food, and biofluids. And then again, looking at these consumer product categories or uses of chemicals, which could represent opportunities for exposure, and taking that information and merging it and identifying ways to prioritize chemicals for evaluation in either biomonitoring or health effects studies. And just to um, again, show the overlap between ECHO and what we're doing here with our, our study to screen chemicals. As you can see, these um, chemicals that are being added that come from different product categories to which we think that people might be using and exposing, which again, we can also check against our suspect screening. So here are some of these product categories here. You see them uh, from the, uh, the table that I presented that um, showed where we found these um, matched samples from our reference standard. So things like child care, conditioner, personal, personal care products here, um, consumer use, um, baby use, et cetera. And these are the number of chemicals in each of these categories, which actually is interesting in itself too, anyway. So this is the, our process we're going through with HART to identify chemical classes and so we'll be able to evaluate these chemicals in these different groups, flame retardants, pesticides, plasticizers, which overlap with the phenols, et cetera. Just want to note again that uh, this is a common theme that we're trying to address, which is we don't have as much information as we'd like or as we need to really make good decisions about these chemicals. So um, right here it says that um, this is some information about the chemicals that we're going to be screening in our, in our medium throughput screening. And a lot of them are produced, or a fraction of them are produced in greater than a million pounds. But most of them, we don't actually have any information about how much they're being produced. Again, this is a, a challenge with the legal framework that we have in the country is that there's not a requirement for these companies to tell us how much they're making these chemicals to which we might be exposed. Um, this is just gives some information about how much data we have on um, ToxRef is mammalian data, which gives us information about uh, whether these chemicals have been tested in a mammalian test system with, for different health effects or ToxCast, which is an in vitro assay that EPA is using. So how do we this will, um, use this information for understanding and interpreting this data? I want to say that um, one of the important things about this screening is it helps us identify what to measure and what to evaluate. Um, we can also use them to identify potential for health concerns. It's important, though, in these screening exercises to understand that the bars are different for identifying something to evaluate further versus saying something is a low priority does not mean it does not pose a health risk. It, could, it often just means we don't have enough information to make a decision about it. And that's very important when I talk a little bit more about TOSCA. And one of the other things we're really interested in is how, how much are pregnant women, the fetus, and children more susceptible to chemicals? Um, EPA assumes that all human variability is a factor of 10, but that may not be true. And some of the issues about how to use science and decision making are covered in these NAS reports, which we are following. But it's really important when we're thinking about evaluating or looking at evaluating this is that EPA is 
developing a framework by which they're going to be evaluating the scientific information right now under the new version of the Toxic Substances Control Act, which looks at these health hazards and exposure pathways, but they are now required by law to account for populations that have greater susceptibility, which could be pregnant women and children, or greater exposures. And both of these are areas where we're focusing on expanding the amount of data that we have to answer these questions. And it will result in these decisions about whether there's an unreasonable risk or no unreasonable risk for exposure to these chemicals, which then triggers only if a chemical poses an unreasonable risk will, as understandable, EPA will address that through uh, some type of regulatory process. I'm not going to go to the summary because it's getting short on time. So I want to say that the suspect screening is a viable method to more holistically characterize a broad spectrum of chemicals. We're using it to identify novel chemicals that may be ubiquitously present, and it helps us develop priorities for both targeted method development but also future studies on sources of exposure as well as health effects. So it has a lot of strengths because we can cover a broad range of chemicals. Um, however, it is a challenge because the sensitivity is going to be lower compared to developing a targeted method. And so we can improve that by adding in more reference standards, which has been something we've been focusing on. This, uh, what I talked about today, talked about a small portion of the chemical space, this environmental organic acid but we're expanding this work to screen for a broader array of chemicals, about 3,000. Um, and there's, you could see there's a lot of computational pieces to this analysis, so that is another area that we're focusing on. And then actually also expanding it to look at matched maternal cord blood samples so we can evaluate uh, fetal exposures as well. And with that, I want to acknowledge all the people who've been doing this work, um, a lot of this was done in the, uh, uh, Roy Girona did the laboratory work, Ellen Wong is our postdoc who did um, the analysis that I talked about today, um, all the people who helped us collect all the biological samples, we're also uh, working with Junsu Park at DTSC who's expanding the analysis, um, and Marina Serrata's lab and our funders, US EPA, NIHS, and some others. That. Thank you very Thank you. much, Dr. Woodruff, for the presentation. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions, uh, so I'd like to open it up to anyone who might have a question online. Um, I'm going to start with our group at NU uh, in the conference room. Are there any questions in the room at NU? Hi, Kristen. Thank you, Tracy. This is Akram uh, over Hi, here Akram. with Cal at Northeastern. Hi, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. I have a quick uh, couple questions. Um, what is the sample size um, that you need for the non-target analysis? And also, when you were looking at these uh, measures um, for the different pregnant women, was it, uh, when was it during pregnancy, or was it all the same, or different time during pregnancy? Thank you. Yeah. So we took the blood samples. Well, actually, we're actually I. It's a, we took the blood samples at the second track. Well, actually, there's a little bit. We started off by saying we we're going to do it at second trimester, but we're actually doing it um, also at third, at delivery, so we can look at the relationship between the delivery samples and the fetal cord blood that we've been collecting. So those are the two different time points. And then um, your first question was, well, you don't, you can, uh, you can do an analysis in any number of samples. We've done everything from, we started off, I think, with about 20 samples to test the method, then we expanded to the 75 to do more method development, now we're doing 200. It's just that as your sample size goes up, your ability to, you know, some of these molecules are very low frequency detection, so the bigger your sample size, the more likely you're going to pick up some of these molecules. I just want to caveat this, though. I mean, what we found is that there's a lot of these chemicals that also uh, may not be present in the suspect screen because whatever, they're, um, there might be endogenous chemicals that look the same. So there's probably a fair number of both false negatives and false positives for various reasons. So for the volume itself to do the analysis in the lab, the volume is that small, large? 
Okay. It's mm -hmm. small, and I can't remember. Okay. I can I'm have to go back maybe you online. I can send you an email just to follow up. Okay, but, yeah. So yeah. Thank you. There's no pre-separation. It's direct injection. Uh, we have a question from Michigan, if I can read it. Um, have you explored any adjustments of suspect screening by chemical half-life to weight the detection of a given chemical? Mm -hmm. No, that's a great idea, though. So I guess we can uh, try that. Um, some people have been exploring looking at various versions of chemical structure to try and help improve the accuracy of the detection, but we haven't looked at chemical, at, uh, chemical half-life. That's a good idea. I mean, of course, you know, some of these chemicals, I mean, you might probably thought we did the phthalates, but the phthalates, themselves are not technically an environmental organic acid, it's their metabolite, um, and phthalates are probably more, they are more regularly measured in urine because they um, are metabolized quite quickly. So, I mean, there's some nuances like that in terms of are we really picking up a phthalate, is it really in the metabolite that gets into some of the details of, you know, whether this is, quote, true or not. Thank you. Any other questions online from um, anyone who wants to unmute themselves and ask a question? I, I don't have any others in the chat at this point. Oh, there's one at Northeastern again. Hi. <laughs> so, sort of getting back to um, Akram's question a little bit, um, the samples, was there any pretreatment to the sample or was the serum itself directly injected? Uh, no, this is the part where I'm not going to be able to answer that quite too much, but the samples are prepped through some, you know, they have to do some, they have to extract, then do some preparation and extraction of the sample before it's um, put into the machine. And that, um, you have like reached the limit of how much I have been in the lab to see. <laughs> Thank you. I'll ask another question, Tracy, if, if that's okay, which is, um, um, uh, this is valuable to do the non-target analysis and, you know, with the difference in sensitivity with the targeted. Did you compare to see um, how much we're losing in sensitivity with, uh, with the non-targeted? Yeah, we haven't really, we've only done this very peripheral type of evaluation, like we kind of look through it and say, oh, well, these kind of compare them just what we know. We haven't, I think, Part of it is it's hard because you don't really know the sensitivity of the QTOP. I will say that um, EPA has been running a proficiency uh, round to, on non-targeted analysis called MPACT, and I understand John Sobis is running that at EPA, and uh, Jun Su Park, who we're working with now on the maternal fetal match sample, is participating in that. And I would say that they probably have more information. I, I think one of the challenges is it's hard to know um, once you have that mixture in there, what the true N is, because sometimes, like for example, they're injecting chemicals into a biological matrix, but sometimes they react in the matrix. So you might have put, put 100 in, but there may be really 120 in there. So I think it's a little hard to totally evaluate it, but the impact will have, be having some papers. I think one is accepted and another is in process that will talk about different aspects of testing the, um, doing the proficiency testing of this in, I think it's blood, water, and dust, so, and there's many labs who are participating in it, not just our lab, uh, the lab that we work with. That sounds great. It's really so valuable to broaden perspective on, on the non-targeted analysis and, and relevance um, in this case. Yeah. And uh, Chris, can another I, question? Yeah. No, there are no more no more questions outside, Akram. Thank you again, Dr. Woodruff. This is great. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm thank happy you, to do you. any follow-up by email, so. We'll, we'll send you a couple of emails if that's okay. We'll follow up, but this yep. is great. Thank you so much. Yep, no problem. Happy right, to do Thank it. you, everyone. We'll be posting the recorded webinar on our site at Protect uh, by the end of the week. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Sid.